It's red, so that means it's live. Welcome to House of Champions, use your friends, drop in your comments and those questions in the chat and make sure you hammer the like and subscribe buttons. Today, we're in something a little bit different as we preview the weekend's top action and breaking down the European top fixtures with some predictions to go suit in the House of Champions. Today, I got my co-host Michael Hood, but a very warm House of Champions. Welcome to our man, Francesco Portio. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you for the yeah. welcome. <laughs> hey, listen, it's great to have you with us. Thank you so much. Just want to check in how you're doing, how's things. Where are you right now before we go any further? I am in Milan, Italy. So it's going to be a nice city to live in in the next couple of weeks, I'm sure. So <laughs> <laughs> pretty tense days ahead, but we are super excited, of course, for these mm. semifinals. And everyone is talking about that. So you can feel it already in there that there is the big semifinals coming up. Mm. Uh, Mike Hullahood, you look like you've either had a haircut, <laughs> you push your hair back, or you're in a different surrounding. What's going on with you? Where are you? Well, each week I'm somewhere different. Uh, I do a midweek show up in Austin, and just think of me as I'm in someone's basement somewhere in Austin. No questions needed to be asked any further <laughs> there, Michael Hood. We'll leave it at that one right there. All right, let's get into it. Obviously, when we have Francesco here, we want to discuss heavily what's happening around Serie A right now. Uh, we just got recent news. Obviously, Napoli's scheduled fixture this weekend has been moved. Francesco, give us a little bit of an update. So why was this game moved today? I don't understand it. I'd like to think that it was because they wanted to have a big party this weekend. Mainly, yes, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> There's unofficial reasons. That, that's the reason why. Uh, but of course, the, the main factor was, uh, was a public order. Uh, basically, they wanted to avoid to have the sort of 24 hours uncontrolled party in the city if Napoli will win against Celeritana. Because basically what has to happen to Napoli to see Napoli win the Scudetto this, this weekend is that uh, Napoli has to win against Celeritana. That's 100% sure. Then they have to hope Inter to win or draw against Lazio. Uh, the, the Inter game will be at 6.30 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, and the Napoli game was supposed to be on Saturday. So they moved the game, uh, the Napoli game on Sunday at 9 a.m. Eastern time. So it will, be, uh, will happen after the Inter game. Uh, <laughs> so potentially they want to have basically the big, big, big party, big, big celebrations on Sunday. And they, did, they wanted to avoid a sort of, you know, 24 hours wait uh, for the for the for the inter game with the old city going crazy because Napoli will go crazy. Trust me. I don't know if you saw some <laughs> videos around uh, in the last days. It's nothing compared to what will happen in the next uh, weeks and month uh, because it's gonna be exactly that's 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 what I was talking about basically. Uh, so this is nothing compared to what we will see in the next in the next month. So they want yeah. to avoid you know a big big big. <laughs> Uh, celebration without having the, the Scudetto title clinched on, uh, on, uh, on Sunday. So they want to make sure everything goes as smooth as possible. I don't know if that will go as smooth, as po smooth but uh, they will try to do that. Yeah, you can see in the video for our people out there who are actually listening to the podcast, we're showing video of the celebrations after they recently turned from that game against Juventus, the, the, the motorcycles following the bus, outstanding. Rafa already jumping in the comments and saying Naples is going to party regardless, <laughs> Francesco. And that's what I'm thinking here, Michael. I don't know if you think the same, but I'm thinking that they just didn't want to party for 48 hours. They're like, let's dull it down just a little bit. 24 hours will keep us in the safe zone here. Oh. What about you, Mike? <laughs> oh my goodness. I've been looking at flights. Usually I look at flights to places is like Ibiza, Mykonos, put Napoli on the map, baby. This is going to be the celebrations of the, the grandest proportions. When you see the motorcycle, the, the scooter, the Vespa gang, not even the, the Vespa gang coming out, riding hard like that, that just gets me going. And, hey, it's a party atmosphere. And, Francesco, question for you. We know that there, there's celebrations that are on the docket for the city of Naples, for Napoli. How does the rest of Italy – view this potential Scudetto, an impending Scudetto win for Napoli? Uh, to be honest with you, it's something uh, I, was, I was thinking today about that. The last time a team that is not Juventus, Inter, AC Milan won a Scudetto was 2001. It was AS Roma. Mm. Yeah. So we're talking about more than 20 years about the, the team that is not used to win every one, two, three years. 
that is winning the title. So that's going to be something really, really interesting to see. Uh, not only the reaction in, in Naples, of course, because we know what we what we were expecting, but also the whole country is going to be uh, in a different mood compared to the last seasons. Because when you were used to win ten scudettos in a row, we were used to that. You know, it's something that uh, mm -hmm. I don't I don't say that we were not celebrating, but it was something usual for us to see Juventus winning. But it, also Inter or AC Milan, we experienced that in the last two years in Milan, uh, were in base that basically. Uh, yes, it's a, of course, it's a big party, it's a big celebration, but it lasted a couple of days. Uh, here we're talking about something that I'm sure that we, we will talk about that for the next couple of years, not days. Uh, so it's a big, big, big opportunity for Napoli, for the whole city. Uh, and talking about the, the view that other Italians might have, uh, I'm sure that many Inter, AC Milan or Juventus fans are happier to see Napoli winning rather than AC Milan into Juventus. For sure, in Milan, that's the feeling that we have. <laughs> that's a great comment to make right there as well. I never thought about it from that perspective that they would rather have Napoli win it than mm. certainly one of their closest rivals. So it's certainly a different perspective. What's your overall thoughts on the way Napoli have handled the situation? Obviously, going out to a very comfortable gap at the top of the Serie A standings, being very successful in the Champions League. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to keep your focus. And we have noticed injuries have not helped them. But overall, this has been a sensational, sensational achievement for a team that lost so many players last season and brought in so many new faces. To achieve this, winning Scudetto would be really something extra special for this group of players. I have to be honest with you. Uh, we are here to make predictions as well. My prediction at the beginning of the season was Napoli not being the top four. Wow. Mm. I have to be honest, wow. so <laughs> that was my prediction because I, 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 I was not expecting Napoli and not many people were expecting Napoli to having this smooth transition with the old players that left, basically, we're talking about club captain Lorenzo Insigne, we're talking about Kalidou Kalibali, who was a key player for Napoli, we're talking yeah. about Dries Mertens, club legend, uh, Fabian Ruiz uh, uh, two years ago, basically, so it was a new cycle and not many knew the potential of players like Kim min -jae or Kvarskeli, of course. Uh, and I think the, the mastermind behind all of that is Luciano Spalletti. The way he handled the pressure, the way he yeah. handled the, the transition, the way he handled also, we're talking about a city with a lot of pressure. Uh, the amount of pressure the fans they put on the team is incredibly high compared to other cities. Uh, also, the owner of the club, Aurelio De Laurentiis, is not an easy person to work with. And he handled this perfectly. And we are talking about a manager who is about to win his first Scudetto in his career. And we're talking about uh, a manager that, in my opinion, is outstanding because Paletti did amazingly well at Inter, Roma, wherever he, he Odinese back in the days, even at Empoli when he started to, to, uh, to, to coach. Uh, he won at Zenit, of course, but in Italy, he never won the Scudetto. And this is something historical also for him. And I think he fully deserves this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I love that we're talking so much about Napoli and them being on the brink, but there's still a big match that you mentioned, Inter Milan facing Lazio, Inter being at home, I believe, Lazio being on the road. Let's talk top four implications, top four predictions in Serie A. That's as almost exciting as the Napoli Scudetto win to come. What's your predictions and how do you see things playing out given some of the big matches this weekend? Also, I was not expecting the, the, the Champions League race to be that tight until then because we, we, were, we had Inter basically two months ago that were very well positioned to finish second uh, and they lost a lot of points along the way. Uh, Inter had 11 defeats so far, which is something, uh, I mean, unprecedented as well for, 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 the, for the Champions League race. You know, having a team that is fighting for the top four who already lost 11, 11 games is, is, uh, is really, really too much for them. Uh, my prediction, to be honest, I see, I see of course, Napoli going, <laughs> going to win the Scudetto. That's not difficult to make a prediction right now. Then I see, to be honest, Juventus finishing top four. And then we have to see what will happen in the summer because that's another big topic. Uh, Juventus might end up in the top four, might uh, qualify for the next Champions League, but then there is the ongoing investigation and the and the FA investigation that may, they might change also the, the future of the club in the summer. Uh, you might be forced to not play any European competition uh, next season, but that's something to, that we have to experience and we will see in the summer what will happen. 
Then, of course, I see uh, uh, Lazio finishing at top four. I, I think they are, they are very well positioned. And then, to be honest with you, between AC Milan and Inter, looking also uh, looking at the, at the schedule that we have in the, in the upcoming games, AC Milan have a, have a um, uh, less difficult schedule. So I think they will end up fourth and Inter fifth. That's my prediction. Talking about Roma, uh, right now, the injury situation is a bit concerning for Mourinho. Um, so I think they will not end up in the top four. Wow. Very good. I mean, listen, I, I love these predictions and we're going to really get into it now as well, Francesco, because I have the same as you as far as top four goes, but I have Inter and Roma sort of swapping positions when it comes yeah. to fifth and six in the standings there. Um, but this is uh, this is certainly a big race. And, and realistically, when you want to have focus on your league, and I'm noticing it right now, my, my league is the Bundesliga. And um, finally, we have a title race. Is someone actually challenging uh, Bayern Munich at the top of the table? It makes it exciting because you were talking about a moment ago, it can get boring watching Juve win the league every year. Now it's obviously Bayern in the Bundesliga. Like, I want to see a, a race. But what you have in Italy right now, is you have a race for Champions League spots, for European places, mm -hmm. obviously really heating up right now. Mike, where are you going with your predictions on that top six? Yeah, uh, similar to you. I, I, had, I think I had Roma, and of course I say that, drink my coffee, and I'll see that it's completely wrong from what I just said. Yes, that's right. Okay, my coffee's working. I had Roma <laughs> in there because of exactly what you said, Francesco. I'd seen Inter's schedule. Inter's got some difficult games, man. And it's really, the question becomes, once they won that semifinal against Juventus to get in the Copa Italia final, they're going after silverware. This is an Inter team that the season, it was in shambles at the start. And Zaghi was up for potentially getting sacked. There was so much chatter about that. They barely scraped through in the Champions League, and that's given them life. The knockout stages of the UEFA Champions League has really become their focus. And if they get past AC Milan and they have a Coppa Italia final or potential for silverware there, then you, you couldn't really blame them for going for silverware in the Champions League and in Coppa Italia and just saying, hey, maybe – we're not in maybe you're that's our access to Europe by winning the Champions League, but that can all change if you don't beat AC Milan. Yeah, yeah. My, my, my point of view is that also uh, it's very difficult to predict what Inter will do in the next month because they are the most unpredictable team this season. They, yeah. uh, they, they, they didn't play good games against smaller teams and then they did amazing games against big, big, against big teams. Think about they were the first team to beat Napoli this season at the beginning yeah. of the year. Uh, so it's very difficult right now. I also wrote that about it because it's difficult to also have a judgment about the season of Inter right now, I think. Uh, because if you see their European campaign, what they've done in the Champions League, I think they've been outstanding. Uh, but then if you look at the, also the Coppa Italia one, they, they, they won against Juventus in, the, in both legs. So I think that's a very good result for Inter. Uh, never happened in the last seven, seven times the Inter won in two legs against Juve. So it's something actually historical for Inter. Uh, mm -hmm. But then if you look at the Serie A, it's, I totally agree with you. It's, it's more than negative what they've done you know, this season. So uh, it's difficult to have a, a final opinion you know, also about Inzaghi. Because if you look at the Champions League campaign, I think that the semifinals will be incredibly important also for his future. Because if he makes it to the final, how can you sack the coach who goes to the, to the, to the Champions League yeah. final? Yeah. How can yeah. you do that? Even if it doesn't make it to the top four. But then I think he, if it doesn't go through and it doesn't make it or it doesn't make it to a top four, there are no real chances to see him staying at the Inter this season. And yeah, this season. Mm. That's, well, that's well said. And I think you can obviously be not confused, but it's, it's very easily to take your eyes away from the big picture. You mentioned it. They've played well in some really big games and including the, the Champions League. What they did against the Portuguese teams impressed yeah. me defensively, in particular against Porto. To not concede a goal against Porto, I was blown away by that. And that's what makes me think that they have a real chance because defensively, they're hard to score goals against. Um, they may not score a ton of goals, but they're a team that can cause problems to the best teams that are around there. 
Um, so I'm really intrigued to see who makes it to the final and obviously see how far they go and then what happens with that story at the end of the season. Do they change the manager or not? Real quickly before we do go to break, though, uh, Francesco, can I ask you about um, the, the reaction, uh, certainly from the media perspective, from fans, from people who just love the Italian game in Italy, who are based in Italy, about Juventus getting their 15 points back? I mean, we have comments coming in right now. Matt Osman says, I hate that Juve are back in the mix. It's ludicrous <laughs> handling of the situation by the authorities. That. Uh, Vic is also jumping in and giving you a shout out here. Vic says, Francesco, it's always good to see you. You've been hiding uh, until the deadline. <laughs> it's good to see you. So overall, your thoughts on Juventus. I'm alive also for the other 30, 364 days of, of yeah. the year, yes. Uh, <laughs> but um, no, I, I think overall what we can say, uh, I agree with the, with the fact that they didn't handle it well. Uh, mm. In general, whatever opinion you can have about the, the point deduction, you know, of course, if you talk with Juventus fans, they say, of course, they did. It. They went. They gave it back. Actually, they didn't give it back. It's uh, we have to wait on, for, on for a new. It's on loan. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We, we have to wait. We have to wait for a couple of weeks to understand uh, what will happen. Really... But for sure, uh, they didn't handle it well. My opinion. It's just an opinion, of course. I'm not a lawyer or someone that works in that mm. kind of in that kind of field. Is that they had to. In my opinion, they had to wait until the end of the season because it doesn't make sense, you know, to I agree. give the point deduction. Then, you know, you give the point backs. Uh, also, the <laughs> Maurizio Sarri, Lazio manager, was very clear in that. He said, uh, it's, it's, it's not a good situation for us. You know, you, you, you play against Juve and they have 50 points less and then you play the week after, they have 50 <laughs> points uh, more than other teams. So it doesn't make sense for anyone, everyone involved in this story. Uh, the feeling around is that something will happen to Juve in the coming weeks. Uh, wow. If not by the Italian FA, you, uh, also the WAFE are investigating on the matter. And we know the relationship with, uh, between Seferin and Juventus are not that good. So yeah. uh, I, think, uh, I think we have to, we have to, we have to wait a bit. Yeah, great. Well said. All right, a couple of comments from our uh, loyal listeners out there uh, before we do go to break here. Aaron jumping in and said, Forza sempre Napoli. Kim is a real monster. <laughs> Should be in the 11 for the season, no doubt about that. Matt oh, yeah. jumping in and saying, Inzaghi is a cup manager. So I'm with Mike here. Mike, you have someone who's supporting you right there. Uh, uh, Lorenzo Castelli, he's saying, it would be funny if Lazio just went at the San Siro anyway. That would be pretty interesting. I wonder what would happen there. Probably, Or, or if down. Napoli don't, don't win against the <laughs> Yeah, can you imagine that? <laughs> you never think about that, right? Because you're no. always thinking it's inevitable they're going to win this yeah. game. It's an opponent you should beat. But uh, listen, that's not it from us. We've got more to come right after the break. We're going to turn our attention, as you can see, Michael LaHood licking his lips. We're going to turn our attention mm. to the Premier League next. Italy's best clubs and brightest stars bring show-stopping skills and unbelievable thrills in the fight to the finish for the Scudetto. Stream every Serie A match live on Paramount+. Plus. Welcome back in the House of Champions. Ian John, Michael Hood and Francesco Porzio, our guest here. A little golf clap once again, Michael Hood, for Francesco for joining us. It's great to have you here, Francesco. Let's discuss the Premier League right now. Michael Hood, I'm coming to you first on this one because Manchester United, they have a tough game. I mean, this is a mega uh, tough game for them against Aston Villa. A little stat, a little nugget I'll throw at you here. Since Unai Emery's first Premier League game in charge of Aston Villa, which was the 6th of November, no side has won more games in the competition than them, which is third 13 games. Arsenal are level on 13 games, but that is incredibly impressive for Aston Villa and Unai Emery. I know Jonathan Johnson is incredibly delighted with what's <laughs> going on, but this is a big game for Manchester United. Top four implications here. Yeah, and, and I just, I wish that we hadn't tried to pursue something like the Europa League. And I, I know we were all taking digs at me when I said, ah, oh, maybe League's Cup is the only thing that United win this year. Well, do I sound as crazy as I did before when I said that? Yes. Look, okay. <laughs> I'm hoping if, if all that happens this season is Leagues Cup and top four, I am a happy, happy man. Of course, the FA Cup final. I want to take out Manchester City, but the, given the way City's happening, that may not happen. But in this game against Aston Villa, Aston Villa, they're in form. I look at the quality of teams. My one question mark and asterisk are the quality of teams that Aston Villa have gotten results against. You don't take any way, anything away from how they're doing it. Ollie Watkins is, has been sensational, especially 
expect him to be the next England call up. If he doesn't get a call up, Garrett Southgate, we're having you on the pod and we're going after you because that would be a disgrace. <laughs> this is the sort of game that will test Villa's credentials of do they actually have what it takes to get into Europe? Aston Villa, Brighton, these are two teams that have a big say on some of the big names in Premier League soccer or football in how they get into Europe or if they get into Europe. Aston Villa, they're a difficult team to play against. Unai Emery, when he came in, Manchester United was one of the first scalps he took. That was at Villa Park, a difficult place to play. This is Old Trafford, where United have looked very, very good. This is a United team that's beaten Arsenal at Old Trafford, that beat Manchester City at Old Trafford, and I expect them somehow, some way, to put a more complete performance than they did against Tottenham Hotspurs to get the result. I expect United to win. Francesco, your thoughts on this game? Uh, I, I'm, I'm with uh, I'm with you, actually. I agree. I agree with you. Uh, I think uh, I think they need also sort of reaction you know, after 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 the, the last game. And uh, I saw before we started also the words from Eric Tenag and how he's viewing about about the game. And I think I think that's the they need a a, a nice victory actually on this game. Uh, and I mean. I, I don't want to be too dramatic about that, but uh, they need to score points because the teams behind are, 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 are also winning a lot of games. So it, there is no time to rest right now in the Premier League because we, we know that it's a kind of league that, you know, if you think that you, you are close to one goal, one target, then you mess it up. So you, they, they have to, I think they have to win and they will win it. Yeah, it's great. And as we mentioned before, previously in Serie A, we also have the same competition happening in the Premier League. Obviously, you still have that race for the title. You have the race for top four for European places. And it's also a battle in the relegation positions as well, which is pretty crazy. So United obviously trying to remain in fourth place and create a bit of a cushion against uh, Aston Villa, which would happen if they did pick up the three points. United only that one loss all season long and certainly a favourite going into this game. Let's turn our attention to the other game. Liverpool against Tottenham. Liverpool unbeaten in the last five. Spurs with an interim manager in Ryan Mason trying to get something going to at least guarantee maybe a European place here. One win in their last six, Mike, here. This is a tough ass for Tottenham, but Liverpool on a decent run right now. They're scoring a yeah. bunch of goals. No, and, and Liverpool, they're going to be at home, which is when it, when it hasn't gone good for them or hasn't gone well for them throughout the season, they at least can go back to their home form. As a United fan, the 7-0, the 7-up, that is something that is still, it's a scar that you live with no matter what happens the rest of the season. Tottenham Hotspur is a stat for you. 20 points this season away from home. The antithesis of what they did last season to get in the UEFA Champions League a qualification spot was being good on the road, not just at home. If you want to get into Europe, you got to turn the tide. They play two of their biggest matches. They go to Anfield, and then in a couple of weeks' time, they go to Villa Park. If they don't get three points or don't get results in those matches, they ain't going to Europe. Mm -hmm. Francesco, your thoughts on that? I, I agree. I think Liverpool will win this, to be honest. Uh, uh, with all due respect to Brian Mason and, and Tottenham, I think if you see the two teams right now, I think Liverpool are better positioned. What's interesting about Liverpool, in my opinion, I don't know about what you think, yeah. is that the moment they started to actually think about the next season, openly speaking about it, you know, saying, OK, this summer we need to rebuild and that. Also, Jurgen Klopp speaking in the press conference about this summer, so already thinking about next 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 season. Basically, it's when they started to perform better on the pitch. Mm. Uh, maybe it's not a coincidence, you know. The, the players are kind of more relaxed and more with less pressure. I don't know. Just, just thinking about it. Uh, so, but I saw a, a different trend in the, in the last games when actually Liverpool started to plan the future in a in a more public way, actually. Because at the beginning of the season, maybe it wasn't like that. They knew that they had to rebuild in the summer 2003. There was something already planned since last year, basically. Uh, but right now, I think... And actually, I, I, I see them going to Europa League in my predictions. Uh, because I see also that with the schedule they have, they have some nice games ahead they can perform. Yeah, no doubt about it. And obviously, it's a great game to look forward to, especially with Liverpool finding their form once again, scoring goals, 11 goals in the last three Premier League games. Uh, Francesco, real quickly, Antonio Conte, no longer manager of Tottenham Hotspur. What was the reaction back home in Italy after he got fired from that job? Expected, I would say, uh, because when you see Antonio Conte, uh, when he's not 100% convinced and happy about his project and his... Uh, 
his status, he's not the real Antonio Conte. We saw, we saw that at Chelsea last season when he was already thinking about leaving the club and things didn't go well. We saw it at Tottenham this season. So there was something that we, we, we see in Antonio Conte quite frequently, actually. Uh, mm-hmm. When he's not happy when, where he is, he started to uh, going against the club and going against some, some players. It's something that, that happened. Uh, but to be honest, I'm sure he will be back soon. I'm sure he will be back as stro- stronger than before because I'm a really big fan of Antonio Conte. He was amazing with the Italian national team. He was incredibly uh, important for Juventus. The world cycle started with Antonio Conte. Let's not forget about that. Uh, at Inter, he brought back the Scudetto after, after 11 years. He's a winner. Uh, Tottenham is the only place he didn't win, but he's in good company with that because other managers didn't manage to do that. <laughs> uh, it's, I, don't, I don't think it's only the fault of Antonio Conte if Tottenham didn't win under, under his, uh, his appointment. Yeah, no doubt about it. And I will say this, though, his rant. I think, it was, if I'm not mistaken, Mike, it was after the yeah. Southampton game where he had that yeah. rant. Yeah. That was an epic <laughs> rant. For me personally, like a lot of people didn't like that. I love yeah. that shit. I thought it was brilliant. He just went after it and he was being 100% real and honest. And like you say, Francesco, he didn't hold back. And you know that something's not quite right within the football club when you start to attack certain people, but also the philosophy of this football club. He's just saying what we're all thinking. Tottenham are just like a sailboat. They're just going along, not really winning, not really losing. They've got a superstar striker. He's getting older yeah. now. And we don't know if we're going to be able to keep a hold of that player. So it's. Uh, I thought it was a really outstanding also, way to, uh, to go out. So, mm. Oh, sorry. Sorry if I inter- interrupt go. you. Uh, mm-hmm. When you hire Antonio Conte, you know what who, who you are hiring. Yeah. You know who you are appointing. So it's not something that you don't have to expect. If you hire Antonio Conte, Inter did the same. They, they wanted Antonio Conte. They knew Antonio Conte was like that. And they won at the end of the day. But it wasn't easy for also the Inter directors to deal with Antonio Conte <laughs> for two seasons. It's not easy at all. So when you hire Antonio Conte, you have the full package. You have the, one of the best managers in the world, in my opinion. But also you have someone that tells you always the truth. Uh, if yep. he's not happy with something, he tells you. And he tells to you and also to the, to the media and to the fans. He's open about that. He's one of the most honest and open people we have in the world of, of soccer, in my opinion. But you expect it. So you have to expect it. Yeah. To be honest with you, it's a lot like us carrying Nigel Rio Coker on the show as well. <laughs> we we kind of know what to expect. He's really he's good at his job. So we like to have him here. But he's a pain in the ass. I'm just going to throw it out there. Uh, Mike, let's get your predictions for how you think this Premier League is going to finish out here. We'll get yours first, uh, explain it, and then we'll jump over to Francesco. You can take it from Mike. Go ahead. Yeah, I, we we've did the the – preview to the Arsenal Man City game and I stick by what we saw and it, it's actually been more emphasized Man City will win the Premier League uh, maybe Arsenal will not get those 88 points we'll see how they respond against Chelsea at the week- weekend Vic your Chelsea versus Arsenal maybe not the weekend but when they play next Newcastle Alexander Isak this guy is incredible high on him high on what they're doing they are get just like a rocket ship just getting better towards the end of the season. I do see Manchester United getting it together, getting their act together by the end of the season to qualify and Liverpool getting into Europe, the games in hand, them getting kind of finding their way, getting back to form and the surprise pick Aston Villa just missing out. Aston Villa beating Tottenham Hotspurs. I think the fact that that game is at Villa Park and not at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium will be the reason. Wow. Wow. Francesca, let's move over to yours then as well. I think the the only big difference is that I have Brighton instead of uh, nice. <laughs> Aston Villa. Uh, I, I was actually looking at the, at the schedule, so I, I, I did my, my numbers. Basically, that's what it came out. It wasn't just... Uh, <laughs> Just the Italian pride of having that Zerb in top six, but actually it is also the Italian pride to have that Zerb in top six because we 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 are we are cheering for him, of course. Uh, and yes, so basically, I, as I said, I see Liverpool going in the in the top uh, in the top five. Uh, I see United finishing strongly. Actually, uh, they think without the the European competition, I think they will they will have more time to prepare the the, the Premier League games. Uh, so that's a, a factor, actually, because if you play Thursday and Sunday, of course, it's it's. We were talking about that for the Champions League for Inter and AC Milan, so it's ba- basically the same concept. 
And then I see more point gap between City and Arsenal, to be honest, because my, my belief, my prediction is that if City manages to win uh, the next two, three games, uh, it will be tough for Arsenal. Also, uh, mentally speaking, you know, to, to be the runner-up and finishing close to the, to the Pep Guardiola's team. Yeah, very well done there. Intriguing as well. I can see that little yeah. celebration from Michael Hoodie of Manchester United sitting in the third place there. I like to see Brighton up there. And obviously, I can see that Italian connection. What Deserbi is doing at Brighton is fabulous. And uh, he's clearly getting respect from many uh, a manager in the Premier League, but also from the media and the fans in general for the way that his team perform. Um, here's a quick look at my top six here. And you'll all be surprised to see that I have Arsenal falling off a cliff and finishing Oof, second. Wow. Just so you know, they're finishing on 83 points. I'm just saying, once you get hammered, and you've got to look at yeah. the results that they've dropped already in the last four games, once you get hammered by Manchester City, what does that do for your confidence? And plus, you're now going up against teams that are competing for, obviously, European places. They're competing mm -hmm. to try and stay away from the relegation. It's never easy. And I see Manchester City. The only draw I think I had in there was City City against Everton with a 1-1 draw. Oh, nice. um, <laughs> but outside of that, I've got them winning all the way through. Uh, for JJ, I put Aston Villa in the top six just because I love JJ. <laughs> and Liverpool somehow getting some results. But Newcastle, I've got picking up 74 points. Mm. Um, as we watched that performance yesterday, you mentioned oh. it already. Individuals, team collectively, Eddie Howe's got Newcastle absolutely purring. And I think that if they can add two or three pieces next year, they might oh. be able to challenge for a top three place in, uh, in the Premier League as well. Hey, Mike, before we do go to a quick break, can you just let us know who you have in the bottom three? Because this is also intriguing me for the relegation spots. Yeah, I, I think I went Southampton, Leeds, and Everton. And we said that the big club was going to go down this season. And I think Everton Football Club, you got Frank Lampard in there that started the fire. I think Sean Dice, he's tried to stop the bleeding a bit. But, man, it's a free fall that awaits them. I mean, just the, the, the in our group chat, the video that you sent us today, that was the laugh I needed. That's the laugh that I think – Everton fans need and it could be a nightmare situation in the blue half of Liverpool. Francesco, did we have you having uh, relegation uh, candidates as well? I have got Nottingham instead of uh, Leeds United. Uh, I, I, my, my belief about uh, is that I think Nottingham, they changed so many, so many things, too many uh, players, you know, they it was, it was a mess actually. Uh, so I think they will go. They will go down. Uh, I I I'm, I will be sad because I think I, li I like the project of Nottingham and the players they signed as well. But there was too much confusion. I think in a way, uh, sort of what Chelsea have done as well uh, last summer. You know, when you sign too many players, uh, it's difficult to put them together. Uh, so I, I will go with, with them. I'm actually jumping on the back of what Vic has said here. Everton, <laughs> Dirty Leeds, and Southampton. Yeah. Those are the three that I've got going yeah. down as well. I'm with you, Francesco, as well. Um, I mean, so many changes is very difficult at the bottom of the table. And Leeds United really scares me right now with what's happening there. And the money that they've spent on players coming in, players on loan, changing coach after coach. And it's it's a mess right now. And such a big club as well. Everton is the one I'm worried about. I've got a lot of friends who are Everton fans obviously don't want to see Everton going down. Um, but I'm not enjoying watching Everton whatsoever. And I've probably no idea why I predicted they'd get a result against Man City as well. So <laughs> great stuff from you boys. Uh, let's turn our attention to the Bundesliga. Bundesliga when we come back from a break. All right, let's get into the Bundesliga as you come back to House of Champions. Ian, Mike, and Francesco here. Francesco, we do have a title race in the Bundesliga with Bayern Munich dropping points recently. Well, Russia Dortmund have messed up the season, but somehow find themselves with a slight advantage over Bayern Munich right now. And I see their fixtures being very favorable. So many people out there obviously will question me, what do you think is going to happen? I'm saying Borussia Dortmund win every single game between now and the end of the season and end up German champions. Do you agree, Francesco, or do you think Bayern a comeback? I'd love to see that, to be honest, but nothing against Bayern, but, uh, you know, to see some sort of change and, and Dortmund winning the title would be absolutely amazing. Uh, so I, I hope that it happens, to be honest. I'm really a big fan of Union Berlin as well, to be honest. So I really, really like the, the team. 
I've been there. I, I lived in Berlin, actually. So I, I, oh. I remember the atmosphere at the stadium. The Alps Forest is one of the best stadiums around. The atmosphere there is absolutely crazy. So I, I really, I really happy to see them. Actually, I remember when they, they, they were promoted to the Bundesliga. Uh, the feeling around was that they could stay one, two years in the Bundesliga and then going relegated again. And they are improving, 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 signing good players as well. So I think. It's really impressive what they've done. And for the title race, I think Dortmund have a really, really chance and will be a big failure for Bayern, uh, an incredible failure, especially after they decided to replace Thomas Tuchel uh, um, to, 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 to sack Nagelsmann and replace yeah. him with, with Thomas Tuchel. That was a big risk, huge risk. And there might be big consequences at the club as well for, for this decision. Yeah, Ian and Francesco, I, I love that you're saying that there's something wrong at Bayern. Ian, you've been the first one, and gosh, I feel like each week from here on out to the end of the Bundesliga campaign, if Dortmund wins, we'll have to apologize to you for when you said there was something <laughs> wrong at Bayern. doesn't happen much on House of Champions, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but you have Bayern losing by five points. What are you seeing from Bayern Munich that makes you think that th there's more points to be dropped? Okay, let me, let me point it out for you. And Francesco made a great point right there. When you replace the manager and a new one comes in, you expect sort of a rejuvenated performance. You would expect some sort of pickup of performance, maybe success, maybe immediate confidence within the group. Let's put it into perspective. When Thomas Tuchel came back to this club, Bayern Munich were in the quarterfinal of a German Cup. They were in the quarterfinal of a Champions League and they were top of the Bundesliga. Seven games he's been in charge of. They are now no longer top of the Bundesliga. They are out of the German Cup and they're out of the Champions League. So that tells me that something is clearly taking its time for Tuchel to either implement his ideas. The players are going their own way. Um, obviously, we know that within the executive group, there are some rumors that maybe Oliver Kahn is on a very hot seat right now. Maybe Francesco knows a bit more than me about that. But, mm -hmm. you know, at Bayern Munich, not everything is great. And it seems to me the culture is the problem right now. You don't have Lewandowski that you can rely on to win you those points. You don't have that player anymore. Chupandovsky or Chupomoting, like people, everybody would know his name by. He's not the answer for them. You just don't have that goal score anymore that you can rely on. Sani, inconsistent, but good. Um, Goretzka, inconsistent, but good. Uh, Kimmich, inconsistent, but good. Um, I mean, you can say Gnabry, the same. And, and obviously, Mane, very inconsistent this season. Consistency is a big problem for Bayern Munich. So I see them dropping more points between now and the end of the season. And let's not forget, Dortmund have already effed up. All right, they've already had this game where they've got, oh my God, what did we do? We lost the title. Bayern are now top again. Now Bayern give you a chance with five games to go. I don't see it. I just don't see it. Francesco, you agree with me or you think it's... Uh, I, I agree 100% with what you're saying. And also wanted to add that uh, it's been a bit underrated, the impact that Karl-Heinz Rummenigge had at the club in the past 20 years, I think. Uh, since he left, something has changed at the club. Uh, of course, people have changed because we have Oliver Kahn right now. We have uh, Sadia Mizi with much more power as a sport director. Uh, we don't have Ones. Uh, we have, uh, we have um, Herbert Heiner as, as president. Yep. Uh, but the impact that Rummenigge had, the influence that he had at the club, was fundamental, was huge. And replacing a figure like Rummenigge is not easy at all because legends are not just by the name, also by the facts and what they brought to the club. Rummenigge was a key figure, had a key role at Bayern in the past decades. So it's not easy to, to, to change directors when also when you change the coaches and players. It's not the same thing. Change a director and not a director like others. A club legend, the, the icon of the club, the one who transformed the club and made him one of the best clubs in the world because Rummenigge was one of the masterminds behind the success yep. of Bayern over the past 20 years. Uh, so I think we are. It's, it's underrated what what has changed at Bayern at high levels in the past two years. Uh, and then I, of course, agree with you about all the players, coaches, this, the, what they, what they've done this season, which was of course uh, not good. But I think it also comes from this kind of problem. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and with so much talk about Bayern Munich, it, it can be easy to forget that there's good things happening and parity happening in this Bundesliga top four race. Ian, you put Union Berlin and Freiburg. I'm so happy that you did that. Big fans of both of these teams. I think the German Bundesliga need teams like that to hold the likes of a Leverkusen and RB Leipzig accountable. I'm picking Freiburg. Said it here first. I'm picking Freiburg to win the Pokal and also get in the top four. So love that you did that. Shout out for you right there as well. A um, couple of quick points there. Um, on you, Francesco, Karl-Heinz Rummenigge has been rumored to potentially be coming back to Bayern Munich if Ooh. they do decide to make this change with Oliver Kahn going out. Um, I'm hearing that he's uh, he's itching to get back in because he's probably at home smashing windows, waiting you know, to get an opportunity to correct the ship right now. Um, and Sally Hamazic, I played against Sally Hamazic when he was at Bayern back in the day. Never in a million years did I think this guy would be a sporting director. Crazy guy. Just an absolute lunatic. And you thought, what? It doesn't make any sense. He's done a good job, but just not the right fit. Oliver Kahn, we all know, um, a little bit crazy. Um, is he as good a businessman as he was a goalkeeper and uh, a goalkeeper who liked to wind people up? And my final thought, as uh, producer Des is pushing me along here, Union Berlin. Uh, Francesco, I love that, that you lived in Berlin. Mm. Um, I played against Union Berlin at the old Altenfurchterei Stadium. And um, I had my first ever female referee, Bibiana Steinhaus. She was the referee oh. back in 2002, it was, the first game I played. And I was playing for Hamburg under-23 team against Union Berlin in the German third division. Think of how things change so quickly. Union Berlin in Europe, Hamburg in the second division. Their first team. Forget about the 23s. It's absolutely crazy how football... Red Bull Leipzig didn't even exist. When you yeah, no, it didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Red Bull didn't exist. Never mind. No, Leipzig. Didn't. <laughs> YouTube right, didn't gonna, even exist. <laughs> we're going to fire through uh, La Liga real quickly just because we love Jonathan Johnson. He's not here, but we want to just uh, touch upon his top six and we can react to this one. Michael, come to you first yeah. on the top six in French football and JJ's predictions. Your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think he's spot on. Uh, the fact that OM and Lance are going neck and neck for second place, I think it's correct. OM plays Lance on the road. OM has a really good road record. If this was at home, I'd actually pick Lance, who has one of the best records in Europe at home throughout the season. Monaco, they get hot at the end of the season. They're doing it again. Ben Yedder getting hot. Ben Yedder, Ben Yedder, Ben Yedder. This guy knows how to score goals in league. Uh, and I think Lille, their inconsistencies in league form. Just when you think they're about to make that jump, Jonathan David, he is a treasure, and he could be the last season we see him at Lille. And Ren, they just miss out. All right, Jonathan Johnson has it. Par- uh, Paris Saint-Germain top, Marseille second, Lons third, Monaco fourth, Lille fifth, and Rennes sixth. Um, Francesco, can you agree with our JJ? Absolutely, yes. He's the French expert, and I wouldn't <laughs> disagree with him. So, But uh, <laughs> I'm happy to see Lens actually in that position mm-hmm. because they what they've done in the past in the past two, three years have been really, really impressive. Uh, uh, so I, I really like to see... To see him well positioned, and uh, hopefully they will make it into a, into the into the top four. So I'm, I'm I'm cheering for them, to be honest. Yeah, I agree with you. Well done, JJ, as well. Shout out to you wherever you are, whatever you're doing right now. I'm sure you and Michael LaHood will be butting heads this weekend. Oh, yeah. Let's turn our attention to La Liga real quickly as we fire through. Mike, your top uh, six predictions, and uh, let us know what you have here. I mean, I'm intrigued because let's not forget, Atleti are not too far away from Real Madrid in second spot now. No, and that's why I was torn. I was texting our producer, Des Norris, who's a big Atleti fan. I I was so tempted to put Atleti second, and I am more tempted now than ever because breaking news, Fabrizio Romano breaking it today, that Luka Modric is injured. I repeat, Luka Modric is injured, not just ahead of the finish to the La Liga campaign, but to the Champions League tie against Manchester City. That is a massive injury. We'll keep updates and keep you updated on how things progress with him. Hope he gets well soon because he is the maestro. Him playing higher up the field has just paid dividends for Madrid in the Champions that's, League. That's a point, Mike. League. Sorry to, to jump in there, but there is no date for his return here Oof, as well, right? Wow. I mean, oh, um, yeah. producer Des is saying he's probably going to miss two league games, but there is no confirmed date as to when he's coming back here. Oh, that that's massive. And Francesco, do you have any updates on on what's going on behind this? Uh, um, basically, um, it's very uh, very usual that uh, Spanish clubs don't say when players are going back. It's something that happens all the time. To be honest, also in Italy, it's very very common to see that. Uh, Ancelotti spoke today to the media and said that 
he hopes to have him back for the Copa del Rey semifinal, which is happening on May 6. So it's going to be, uh, yeah, in two weeks. No, no, one week. Uh, maybe. Nice <laughs> yeah. uh, no, in one week, yes. Uh, so that's that's his hope. Then we have to see, of course, we're talking about a 37 years old player. So someone that we need to mm. be very careful in that uh, with, the, with the evaluation of the injury. Probably my feeling is that uh, it's just a feeling, but they will try to have him fit for the first leg of the Champions League semi-final against City. So yep. it, there is no point to risk him with all due respect for the Copa del Rey, for the King, Pereira, but uh, there, is no, there is no point to risk him for, 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 the, for, the, for the final, considering they have the huge game against City a few, couple of days after. So, But of course, we're talking about La Liga, because here we're talking about La Liga prediction. Yeah. Missing two La Liga games, consecutive two La Liga games for a player like Modric and the importance he has for this team and for Carlo Ancelotti is hugely important. Uh, even though if there is one part of the, of the, of the roster where Real Madrid are covered is the midfielders one, but uh, we have to see how they, how they cope, cope with his absence. Yeah, I think that's really well said. In my prediction list, depending on the gravity of Modric's injury, because of the importance of games, the Champions League of Madrid get to the final, and this is with the Champions League final and them doing the unthinkable in, in at Premier League circles and getting past Manchester City, I think Atleti squeezes the gap and they just miss out on second place. Via Real, don't sleep on them because Real Betis, it's been a free fall. They have not been good since the World Cup break. I do think they have the individual quality to get it together and get a European place. Villarreal, they do have some major injuries, and a lot of those same players, Los Celso being back in the fold, a lot of those same players will have to grind it out week in and week out to just miss out on Europe in the end. Ed jumping in and saying, swap Real Madrid with Atleti, and I'm basically in agreement with Mike. That's a bit of a disagreement right there. I mean, he has Real Madrid finishing finishing second, and Atleti finishing second yourself there, Ed. That's a bit more than a disagreement right there. Mm -hmm. Uh, Listen, great stuff. Great to have you on with us, Francesco. And can you just let everybody know, I mean, you're a part of the CBS Sports family. Uh, We know what you're doing with Fabrizio Romano as well, but where can people follow you? Maybe mention your social media handles and what you're doing uh, with uh, Fabrizio as well oh yeah basically we uh i'm i'm big friend of fabrizio first of all and then we work together but uh, it's a work friendship uh, relationship uh, so we are <laughs> we are <laughs> since many years right now uh then of course you can you can find me on twitter uh fraporzio 95 is my mm. my account on instagram whatever you want you can you can reach out to me and we'll we'll get we'll get in touch with you whenever Thank you so much for being a part of the show. And I'm sure it will not be the last time that we have you on here. A lot of comments coming in asking for you to come back as well, which is great. It was a pleasure for me. (laughs) Yeah, thank you for joining us. And thank you to you as well, Mike. Enjoy this weekend. I know you and JJ will be getting after it. um, But we look forward to catching up with everybody next week. Thanks to everybody for listening to House of Champions. Take a minute to leave us a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform or available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere else you listen to your podcast. Also available as video. So subscribe to us on YouTube as well. Michael, Hood, Francesco Porzio, and Ian Joy from House to Champion signing out. Have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye bye. <laughs>